Welcome everyone to Cancer Center Grand Rounds. Uh, it's a real pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dan Sherbino. Uh, Dan has been studying blood cancer for a long time. He, uh, he trained and did his MD PhD at Oregon Health Sciences University where he worked with Brian Drucker and Mike Dininger, uh, mainly in and around leukemia. Then went on to do a residency and fellowship, um, first at the University of Utah and subsequent to that at UCSF. And it was at UCSF where he switched from leukemia to focusing on multiple myeloma, which has of course evolved to be his main area of interest. And he did some seminal work at that time actually in identifying some unique therapeutic strategies to attack multiple myeloma. And, and, and very nicely, I think uh, that works you know, the work that he did as a fellow has now been translated all the way to the level of a clinical trial with a novel therapeutic agent where the University of Colorado is actually one of the sites testing that agent. So Dan cut his chops early in the translational medicine world and has continued to pursue that in a big way. Uh, we were very fortunate to recruit him to the University of Colorado in 2015, where he was the initial member of what's now grown into a three faculty member myeloma team. Dan anchors the, uh, the laboratory piece of that and works very closely with two of our clinical researchers uh, around the overall program to translate therapeutics in the multiple myeloma space. Uh, he's, uh, he's been very su successful in establishing his own laboratory and the research program there. So myeloma is interesting and a little different than other forms of cancer. In many cases, uh, investigators are sort of searching for, um, for drugs that, that will have activities and are, are limited. Myeloma is different in that there's millions of drugs, or at least it feels like there's millions of different drugs that have activity in myeloma. So one of the biggest challenges for clinicians in that field is actually figuring out which drugs to use and how to use them at different stages of pathogenesis. And this, this has actually turned into a very complex problem and standard of care is hard to define because of these, these nuances. So Dan, early in his research career, is focused on the heterogeneity that's inherent in these tumors and trying to figure out ways to address that in designing therapeutic regimens. And he'll tell you about that, so I won't, I won't give away any more, but I think it's a really important need in the field that has not been well addressed in myeloma. And, and as a young investigator, he's taken on, I think, an important an important aspect there. He's been very successful in those initial uh, efforts. He was acknowledged with the NCCN Young Investigator Award and, and then subsequent to that, the KO8, which is, as every, I think many people know, is a very, had a very prestigious award. So really marking him as a rising star. Uh, he's also been on quite a tear recently publishing. He's had four papers dealing with various aspects of, of um, developing novel therapies that have just come out in the past year. Uh, so things are really taking off for him. So Dan, thank you so much for being here today. Looking forward to, to hearing about your work. Thank you, Craig. Uh, thanks, always an honor for you to introduce me. So thanks for doing that. I'm gonna try and successfully share my screen. Are you all seeing my slide view? No, wrong one. Wrong one? So we're, we're seeing the presenter view. You need to swap the screens. Okay. Hey, Better? that's it. Okay, good. Um, I'm looking at the wrong camera, so forgive me for that, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and start anyway. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's been actually since I first started here at the university, since I gave this particular seminar, so um, really uh, happy to be back and excited to present some things that um, I haven't presented before. Um, I was just realizing producing this talk that I haven't actually given a seminar of any kind be since before COVID, so it's been about a year. Um, and this was kind of fun, kind of just looking at what we've done over the last five years, which I'll, I'll kind of talk about in the first half, but then, you know, basically establish establishing also where we're going as a launching off point in the, in the next uh, few years. So, um, so it was really fun for me to put this together and I thank you for joining me today. Um, and the theme that I'll uh, eventually get to here is interrogating the uh, intrapatient subpopulation heterogeneity that we're finding in patient samples uh, from uh, multiple myeloma. So multiple myeloma, uh, just kind of from a 3,000 foot view is 
uh, the most differentiated blood cancer, or one of the most differentiated on the lymphoid side of the hematopoietic uh, tree. So here you have hematopoiesis, and if a stem cell goes down the lymphoid side, you have various types of acute lymphoblastic leukemias, um, more differentiated lymphomas, and multiple myelomas, malignancy of the, the antibody-producing cell, the end of the tree there, the most differentiated um, type of lymphocyte in a way. So this is a unique disease because these are antibody producing cells and when they become, when they clonally expand, they um, secrete a monoclonal antibody and we can detect that in people's blood. So I'm gonna describe this because I'll mention this is our, I'll show you a lot of graphs. This is our tumor marker and, and we have a couple of different ways of measuring monoclonal antibody. The first is just a serum protein electrophoresis, which is shown on the top that's pretty familiar, I think, to most people, but it's just a protein gel where the gamma region usually shows you the IgG. If you see a discrete band that's um, basically all the same, um, that indicates a monoclonal antibody. And um, it's pretty common for people to have an expansion in this compartment, and we call that MGUS. It's about 10% of the population has that over the age of 65. If that uh, progresses and starts to cause symptoms, we call that multiple myeloma. Uh, and what we're detecting here is the fully intact uh, antibody, the Y-shaped protein on the bottom left. We also have a free light chain assay that detects uh, the light chain part of the antibody protein, which um, in all of us circulates to, to a very low uh, degree as a free protein not bound in the full IgG. Um, and some, some people just make light chain only. So this, this becomes important for monitoring some patients uh, as their, if their disease mutates and, and doesn't make fully intact IgG. So that's for monitoring. Um, so this is a little bit about the epidemiology uh, of myeloma within the context of blood cancers. I really love this slide, even though it's outdated. I got it from Dan Pollier a few years ago. Um, basically, the size of the bubble here for myeloma in yellow shows you the incidence compared to lymphoma, leukemias. Um, the average age of onset is a disease of older people. The average age is 78 years of age at diagnosis. And what's really um, changed is the median overall survival has um, really shifted to the right uh, as we've developed new therapies since about 2000. We really um, as, as Craig alluded to, there's a lot of different uh, therapies that are on the market now. Uh, and that's really moved the needle in terms of the overall survival. The bubble is actually getting bigger as well. And I think that might be related to our aging population. Um, the, it's, it's the only malignancy for which the incidence has increased steadily over the past several years. Um, so it's a, it's, a bigger, it's a bigger and bigger problem. People are living a longer time, so the population is ever expanding. And really, as I mentioned, we've changed the outlook for this disease. Um, we currently know that if a patient's optimally treated, if they can get a stem cell transplant, uh, autologous stem cell transplant, um, which is basically just a way to give high dose chemo and maintenance therapy and all the drugs available to them, the median survival should be more than 10 years. So it's really um, been an amazing story in terms of uh, drug development. Um, so I want, I want to kind of help you understand, at least from a broad view, the underlying genetics of myeloma. They're quite diverse and complicated. Um, I like to make this simplified Venn diagram to illustrate this. About a third of patients have translocations, which, which usually involve the promoter of either the IGH or, or, or light chain um, genes, the antibody um, uh, promoters. Uh, and that's kind of the donor. So they get translocated with two other chromosomes that put um, various oncogenes under the control of those promoters. And, and that drives a, a lot of people's myeloma. Um, about another third of patients have gains or losses of um, uh, chromosomes. Uh, sorry for the misspelling there. Uh, and then a third have either normal side genetics or point mutations. And these are kind of the common actors that may be uh, P53 or the RAS proteins, and then a whole host of other more rare um, uh, point mutations. 
So kind of three buckets there and they're overlapping to a large degree uh, as far as underlying genetics that drives myeloma. And so the way we stage myeloma is it's kind of metastatic at baseline since these cells are basically kind of uh, migratory and they, they live throughout your bone marrow and, and even to the, in the blood to some degree. So the way we classify a risk drive by patients is basically by age, a uh, couple of inflammatory markers, LDH and beta-2 microglobulin, and then some really high-risk chromosomal abnormalities, which include the deletion of 17P, which represents the loss of P53 protein, a couple of specific translocations involving FGF receptor 3 and MAF proteins. Um, so you can see that this, these are patients, actually, this is a little bit old as well, but uh, patients that were treated before 2009, um, and, um, you know, they're, like I said, ISS2 and ISS1, uh, the lower and standard risk uh, groups are living, you know, seven years at this point or, or longer. Um, and, and then there's, you know, a, a subfraction of patients that uh, really are kind of one focus of our research is to determine how to improve the outcomes for this high risk uh, group of people that are really dying in three or four years. Um, so the unique targeted therapies in, in myeloma are really quite fascinating. Um, I like to kind of explain this from a phenotypic point of view rather than a genotypic one, because a lot of these therapies take advantage of the cellular aspects of these cells where they, they are basically protein factories. That's what they were born to do. So they are um, always secreting antibody and as a result of that have uh, a lot of you know, basically protein synthesis by, byproducts. Um, so that leads us to the proteasome. Uh, proteasome inhibitors are um, uh, one of, I would say, the three pillars of myeloma treatment currently. If you block this, uh, this proteasome, basically um, these cells die in their own garbage. They're not able to cope with the proteotoxic stress that results from that. Um, there's um, immunomodulatory agents, which are another interesting story. They're actually basically degraders. So they uh, bind to a E3 ubiquitin ligase uh, complex that's uh, a protein called cerebron and facilitate that to be basically act as a molecular bridge to allow cerebron to degrade Icarus proteins, which are basically key survival transcription factors that are uh, present in these cells. So degrade those proteins, the cells undergo apoptosis via that mechanism. Um, and these are the, another um, pillar of our treatment. Um, third, we've got monoclonal antibodies um, since 2015 have really revolutionized the treatment first for our relapse disease and now more recently in newly diagnosed setting as well. Um, these focus on basically targeting unique antigens that are present on these myeloma cells and marking them for the immune system to come in and remove them. Uh, Daratumab is really the biggest agent in this group, uh, targets CD38. Just within the last year, we got a second molecule, a second drug that targets CD38 called Ethotuximab. Got a less, less potent drug called Elituzumab. And then just a couple of months ago, uh, the first antibody drug conjugate was approved for multiple myeloma, which is called uh, BELMAF for short, Belantamib Mephidotin. Uh, is a mouthful, but it targets a, a unique antigen on plasma cells called BCMA. So beyond those three pillars of treatment, we use some steroids, we use some alkylator chemotherapies, we use some other chemotherapies, but really that's kind of our backup plan now, nowadays. Um, so uh, there are a couple of other agents I won't get into much that are FDA approved. And more excitingly to me is that the pipeline is just incredibly active for multiple myeloma. There are several bispecific antibodies um, that are showing amazingly high response rates in a multi-refractory population. Um, the CAR T cells will probably be approved actually later in February this month uh, for multiple myeloma, um, which will be another huge victory. Um, the CD4680 C, as Craig mentioned, was something that um, is in phase one here that, that I helped develop dating back to fellowship. Um, Venetoclax is promising a subset of patients with uh, T1114 
And we've got kind of a fancier alkylator called methylven that's probably going to be FDA approved in the next couple of months as well. So a lot going on uh, in this space. So how do we put that together as far as treating patients? Uh, it's complicated. <laughs> the first, we kind of stratify people whether they're high risk or standard risk, if they're fit, meaning they're, you know, um, can get three drug therapy or four um, versus frail patients, which are older and have comorbidities and, and are less likely to tolerate uh, multi-agent treatment. So when the patient's fit, they go through frontline induction, which usually involves three drugs. Um, and uh, nowadays, even with uh, daratumumab in, in a quadruple regimen. So um, that's our first line therapy. We induce people and get them into remission. And then they go through an autologous stem cell transplant. And this is pretty uniform treatment across the country. After they go through the transplant, they go on a maintenance uh, therapy, which is usually single drug revlimid uh, or lenalidomide, the, the new modulatory agent that I mentioned. But sometimes we, we, if people are high risk, we take a more aggressive tact. And, you know, in the frail, it's, it's a little bit harder because we really are sometimes restricted to using two drug regimens, which we know don't work as well. So the event, you know, the first remission is the best for patients, but eventually their disease comes back and we go through second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line, as each time they subsequently relapse. So I kind of frame it this way, as far as we usually use bortezomib or lenalidomide or both off the shelf first, then daratumumab. And, and so patients kind of go through this complex evolution where they become uh, refractory to those different agents. Uh, we have second generation imids and um, proteasome inhibitors to, to cycle them through next when they get re resistant to that. Um, there's really not a lot of efficacious treatments for them and the, their outcome right now is probably about nine months. Um, so that's the pinter refractory box here at the far right. So these patients are really, what they're left with is clinical trials, Selenexor or Belmath that I mentioned that these are not, not extremely active like all these other drugs that we have in the first through fifth line really. So um, it's quite amazing people often, will, it's not unusual to see people go through 10 lines of therapy before they eventually succumb to their disease. So as I mentioned, preferable to get people three drugs whenever we can. So to kind of put that in context of a patient, this is a patient that uh, of mine that lived six years from diagnosis. So didn't have identifying high risk features at diagnosis, but really had a hard time staying in remission. Um, you can see up here, we use this kind of standard three drug um, induction. And unfortunately she kind of um, started to relapse on that. So went through a multi-agent chemotherapy regimen called VD pace and then a second line induction um, with carfilzomib. Uh, eventually got transplanted, but only stayed in remission for about a year, which is um, not a good outcome. We hope for three to four years in that first remission. So her disease starts coming back here and we go basically cycling through these um, relapsed regimens, you know, anywhere from four two to four drugs. Um, you can see we never really gained very good control of her disease. And, you know, eventually she, become multi, she became multi-refractory, tried clinical trials and various other kind of last ditch efforts to try and control her disease. But um, she eventually died um, uh, in 2019 of, of this disease. So that's to give you an idea for how this works for people, especially when they have high risk and difficult to treat disease. So a little bit more about immune therapies. So I'll talk a lot about this stuff. So um, as I mentioned, R2 map, elituzumab, they, they work by antibody dependence, uh, cellular cyt cytotoxicity and complement dependent cytotoxicity. So they activate your own immune system. Um, so CAR T cells are probably familiar with. Um, right now, the, the target that we're, we're looking at is BCMA. Um, like I said, the CAR for myeloma targeting BCMA will probably be approved later this month. Um, if for ADCs, there's the uh, Belmath is approved with the BCMA target, the CD46 is of interest to us. And then for bispecifics, they target BCMA, they target a couple of other proteins that I'll mention at various times in this talk called FCRL, uh, sorry, FCRH5, that L's extra and GPRC5D. 
So to give you a little bit more context about our lab, we started in 2015. Uh, I like to break our history up into two phases because really in the, for the first five years, we were getting up and running and, and uh, getting our initial projects, with, which really have laid the foundation for the phase two, which is basically started last year. Um, so we, as uh, Craig mentioned, we had a couple of papers. So we published on the CD46 uh, antibody drug conjugate. Um, just mention that because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about it, but I will mention CD46 a few times. So keep in mind that we like it as a, as a drug target. Um, last year we published on a platform that we use to profile drug sensitivity um, that we call MyDST. And I'll, I'll spend uh, 10 slides talking about this. Um, talk briefly about how we use that really to uh, how we use the Midas DST platform to start studying translational inhibition and in multiple myeloma. And, and uh, yeah, with that, I'll go ahead and jump in with the MyDST uh, story to tell you a little bit more about that. So in terms of personalized medicine, uh, you know, in, in the current day and age, it's really uh, genomics focused. And you can recognize this by um, looking at the NCI MATCH trial, which is a solid tumor trial that you know basically does whole, you know, whole genome sequencing or at least targeted uh, oncogene sequencing, finds targets, and then you get the drug that targets the mutation that you have. Um, so this is a little bit out of date, but you know that the initial response rates from that approach were pretty low, unfortunately. In AML. Uh, similar approach, uh, basically sequence everybody and then and then put uh, put the patient on a, a drug that targets their mutation. Um, and that's you know kind of just to exemplify the, the approach to personalized medicine right now. And myeloma is not really any different. There's currently a trial that's just gone under um, uh, just beginning basically in multiple myeloma where we're sequencing all myeloma patients. And this is through the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. So it's a huge multi-site trial called MyDrug um, using the genomics to really uh, dictate what arm people go on. This is kind of unique because they basically get a lead in of basically uh, dexamethasone plus the inhibitor that targets their mutation. And then after that, if it works, go on like a three drug myeloma regimen called IPD or or exazomib, pomalidomide, dexamethasone, um, plus the targeted agent, so a four, four drug um, after the initial two cycles. And really, there's not a lot of patients that qualify for these different, you know, there's not a lot with RAS mutations or RAF mutations or IDH mutations. Um, so, and this really hasn't panned out historically in myeloma, except for venetoclax, which I mentioned it, it really works well for people at, T1114. So that's the one thing we we confident that will work. So we, we kind of felt like this was a little bit maybe favoring too much genomics. And we decided to take a different approach that really focused on um, people's phenotype. And that's kind of led us to developing my DST. And the idea here is that we obtain bone marrow aspirates from patients. Uh, we put them in culture for 48 hours in a 96 well plate. And then we uh, go through multiple myeloma-specific flow cytometry using a live dead stain so that we can basically score a drug, whether it killed that myeloma population or not, in culture at, in an ex vivo setting. And then we kind of, you know, basically can score all these different drugs. Are they resistant? Are they sensitive? And give a profile for that particular patient. Um, so this was really spearheaded in my lab by Zach Walker and Mike Van Weingarten, um, my first uh, two PRAs at the university, and Zach's still with us today. Um, and the torch has kind of been picked up by Lauren Ryman, who's now kind of um, studying basically my DST 2.0, if you will. So, um, so a little bit more detail. So a couple of ground rules that we kind of established. We decided on a 48-hour time point for these cultures because really after 48 hours, the viability of the cultures um, went way down and that's shown in the first graph. Um, so after 72 hours, their viability really tanks. Um, so after initial thaw or after initial biopsy, uh, there's an initial first phase of decline and then they, they kind of stabilize. So we, we use that 48 hour time point to get a, a basically a viability readout on those, on those myeloma cells. 
Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing that we felt was important was that um, every, almost every lab really for myeloma, at least historically, had used CD138 selection to um, study myeloma. And that's great for genomics and, um, and other types of studies, but it really doesn't work well for this type of assay because, you know, really the, my, the myeloma cell viability really um, takes a huge hit from this the going through the column. Uh, maybe that's the column damage, associated damage, or maybe that's that they just that they miss being around their friends in the culture. So we found that um, culturing them in the whole bone marrow with the microenvironment cells um, preserved their viability much better. And that's in the middle graph. So, and then lastly, we went through further optimization basically by um, humanizing this media um, that we use. So it's not a cell culture based media. Uh, as much as um, uh, trying to balance all the physiologic concentrations of amino acids and um, other uh, ingredients to make it as close to peripheral, human peripheral blood as, as we can. Um, so those are kind of the ground rules of the assay. And what we focused on initially was studying agents that were really you know, key to our myeloma treatment. So the bortezomib, the proteasome inhibitor, um, so we studied two proteasome inhibitors, two imids, um, the steroid dexamethasone and, and uh, chemotherapy cyclophosphamide. You can see in this particular patient, the, the drugs have quite different activities in terms of their ability to kill the, the myeloma population in this patient. And so we worked out drug res uh, dose response curves for all these different drugs in sensitive drug naive patients. And basically settled on a either EC50 or a minimal concentration of max effect so that we could use to judge other samples as being sensitive or resistant um, in a single concentration kind of screening assay. So we um, selected these concentrations um, that were really kind of drug dependent um, to, to, to screen for their samples. And so the initial cohort we looked at was, um, was 50 some patients where uh, the, the left side of this heat, heat map is uh, newly diagnosed patients. Going to the right goes to multi-refractory, so six lines of therapy at the most. You can kind of get the impression that, you know, there's some red, there's some drug resistance in the, in the beginning in, in patients. But as you get to this multi-refractory side of the graph, there's, you know, a, a ton of uh, drug resistance. And, and, and so it kind of correlates well with the... Uh, uh, what clinically happens to these people and the, the, the setting of their prior lines of therapy. Um, and we really observed that the, if the patient sample came from a, a patient that had been exposed to the particular drug class, you could see that that changed the, uh, the drug sensitivity. And that was the case for proteasome inhibitors, uh, immunomodulatory drugs, and, and daratumumab. Um, wasn't as clear for dexamethasone or cyclophosphamide, so we kind of narrowed our focus a little bit onto these drugs that we know that we can get a good readout for. And so if we combine the scores that we got um, across the board and, and got like an additive ex vivo combination effect uh, on the y-axis here, so the better score being or more sensitive being on the left or lower side of that axis, um, if we got it below that combination score below 50%, that was pretty predictive of people uh, on the y-axis getting a deep response. So at least a partial response or 50% decline in their disease or better. So these, we call the true positives, you know, basically we want to get in this green um, area where the patient's responding and we're actually predicting that they respond. On the other hand, we were picking up the patients that didn't respond well, they got less than a a 50% decline or less than a partial response, uh, correctly identifying them as true negatives. Uh, you know, we didn't, we, it wasn't perfect as any test. There's uh, one false negative, one false positive, but overall this gave us performance characteristics for the test of 96% sensitivity, 86% specificity, which, you know, uh, not to toot our own horn, but um, I don't, I'm not aware of any chemosensitive a assay for cancer ever really putting performance uh, characteristics on a, on an ex vivo test like this um, successfully. So we're really, really proud of that, um, that accomplishment. So, um, you know, to kind of further 
correlate with the outcomes to see how patients did, uh, we saw that, you know, basically patients that if they got at least two drugs that were scored as sensitive in our MyDST assay, they had deeper responses. And the left graft is just the newly diagnosed setting. The right graft is the um, relapse setting. So it translated to both. So um, that was good. And in addition, getting at least two drugs or more that were sensitive led to, you know, a longer uh, time in remission or event-free survival. Whereas those patients that we identified as only getting one or zero drugs that were sensitive in the assay, um, they relapsed or had to change therapies pretty quickly. So, um, so we, you know, therefore we feel that using this type of approach could help prevent inadequate responses of patient and extend time in remission. So I'll, I'll get a little bit, I'll get back to our future directions with that uh, in, in the, uh, at the end of the talk. Um, but to switch gears a little bit, um, we also tested a drug called Omicetaxine in our MyDST cohort. And uh, this was kind of a serendipitous suggestion from Brett Stevens in the Jordan lab who had been looking at this drug in, in MDS and um, suggested we try it in myeloma for reasons I won't get into. And it actually worked out really well. We found that Omicetaxine uh, was really good at killing myeloma cells in patient samples, as, as is shown here in the raw data from a MyDST assay, where you have untreated or vehicle control, um, you know, a nice myeloma population, and really almost all of those cells are eliminated specifically by the omocetaxine. So what is omocetaxine? Um, so it, it's a protein translation inhibitor, as I mentioned. It's actually FDA approved for chronic myeloid leukemia. It doesn't get much use, unfortunately, because tyrosine kinase inhibitors work so well. Um, the main side effects in patients are cytopenias, um, but overall it's you know, tolerated by humans. Uh, it's, its administration is a little inconvenient. It's given subcutaneously twice a day. Um, but point being, ultimately, it's a drug that we can give the patients and um, it works. Um, uh, to inhibit translation in the human. Um, and we, you know, previous studies had shown that it worked well in, in cell lines. So, so we got, uh, we got interested, as I mentioned, to study this in, in multiple myeloma. And kind of the thought at that time was that it inhibited proteins that had a short half-life, like MCL1 or CMYK. Um, that's not how we think it works now, but that was kind of our hypothesis initially. And this was work that was done again by Zach uh, Walker and, and with a lot of help from Bo Eidler, a technician that, that went to medical school uh, last summer. So again, we worked out the dose response group for almost a taxi and we found that about EC50 of 50 or a single concentration of screening uh, uh, dose of 50 nanomolar was pretty good for predicting sensitivity. Um, and, you know, across a good sized cohort of, I think about 50 samples in this instance as well. Um, didn't matter if people were classified as sensitive to both MNs and PIs or resistant to one or the other in the yellow and orange bars or resistant, you know, kind of multi-refractory to MNs and PIs. Uh, across the board, the almost the taxi worked pretty well. Um, so even in that kind of multi-refractory disease setting that we are currently, you know, enrolling people on clinical trials for, so we, we were kind of impressed, um, to say the least, with that broad effect. Um, and it really didn't cause a lot of death in the non-plasma cells, so it was pretty specific. So we, we kind of wondered if that was due to this protein factory nature of myeloma cells. Um, you shut off protein translation, maybe that's, you just don't like that. You know, that's, that's inhibiting what they were born to do. Um, so we started using this uh, OP Puro, or, uh, assay, which is a low cytometric uh, way that you can me measure the, um, the rate of protein synthesis and, and protein translation in cells. And we started finding that, you know, in myeloma cells, there's always a, a, you know, a nice shift in, in the signal. So the rate of translation is high in myeloma compared to non-plasma cells. Um, so the, that served as a biomarker really. So the low translation um, group really were not as sensitive uh, with a cutoff of two point, at least 2.5 fold increased high translation predicted a good drug response. So 
I'm going to leave that uh, and, and talk about another clinical question we wanted to answer, which was um, looking a little bit more at, at daratumumab. So as I mentioned with my DST, we could really pick up those patients that were drug naive to daratumumab, and that's that's kind of in the newly diagnosed group here and, and the relapsed but drug naive group here, as opposed to the relapsed uh, DAR refractory patients, which really had lost their ex vivo sensitivity to the drug. Um, we looked at CD38, the target level, and that that was, you know, not all of the story, but certainly a lot of it, that the DAR2 map resistant patients or refractory patients are down regulating their CD38. And so this um, gets to Olivia's project, and she's been looking using my DST to see if we can retreat patients after they've been off of daratumumab for a period of time. And I, th I think really amazingly has shown this correlation, a very significant correlation with the more months that you're off of DARA, if we get a, a bone marrow biopsy, we can see that basically, eventually the daratumumab sensitivity, sensitivity comes back. Um, and so, you know, maybe after 15 months or more of, 16 months or more off of the daratumumab, you can use it again, uh, which would be really, you know, great for, uh, great option for patients potentially. Um, I mentioned isotuximab in the beginning, so we don't have as much data. It's not a significant correlation, but it does kind of seem that, uh, if anything, patients are getting sensitive sooner to the other CD38 antibody. And when we compare them head to head, not significantly, different from daratumumab, but it does consistently seem to outperform daratumumab. So we think you may be better off switching agents if you do retreat a patient with, with a CD38 monoclonal antibody. And one thing that she identified here was um, that some of these daratumumab patients looked like they had interesting subpopulations that had variable levels of CD38 versus uh, CD138 or two kind of classic myeloma markers. And uh, when she kind of graded out the MyDST results, depending on subpopulation, um, you know, in, in these three examples basically saw one example where you're really having a, a CD38 negative population that is um, drug resistant um, to, to daratumumab. These couple other instances look like you have enough CD38 or you have enough sensitivity that it doesn't, doesn't matter as much. But this really brought up to us this concept of subpopulation, which, as I mentioned, was kind of the most important uh, word in my title um, and is really kind of shaping the way we kind of started to think about how to go about studying myeloma from here. Um, so kind of a model of myeloma, and I think, uh, I think at diagnosis there might be a lot of different um, myeloma type cells, you know, at a subclonal level. Um, when we get people in remission, they, that might kind of reduce the complexity to a degree, but we really don't know what those cells look like because they're so rare. Um, they're really just very, very hard to detect. Um, at relapse, you know, maybe the complexity increases and, you know, eventually it might be one particular subclone or subpopulation that eventually kills the patient. So that's kind of the working model that we wanted to investigate um, by basically biopsying these people from diagnosis to MRD state or minimal residual disease state to, to relapse. And I think that one of the implications of that model is, of the subpopulation model is, um, you know, kind of uh, basically captured by, you know, one of my favorite papers, um, Palmer and Sorgren, Cell 2017, um, basically, putting a lot of math behind a concept that I really felt was true in oncology that um, there's really me mechanistic synergy is probably pretty rare between different drugs, you know, working complementary um, pathways. Um, but more likely there's, you know, a group of patients that are going to respond to one drug and a group that are going to respond to drug B. So when you add them together, whether you want to call that additivity or whatever, it's semantics, but um, they're naturally going to work better. And so I think that's the basis for, you know, needing three drugs in myeloma. You need, you need to, this combinatorial effect. So I think you know, if I redraw that for myeloma, I think it also holds for looking at cell populations. So um, so if you have, you know, two groups of cells that are, uh, 
or if you have a, a subpopulations of cells, some of them might be sensitive to drug E, some, some might be drug B, you put them together, you're killing more of the population. So I really think, I think uh, bears that combinations are gonna be more effective. The second implication of that is really kind of the, the dreaded partial response. In myeloma, when we treat patients, if they get less than 50, they get a 50% to 90% um, decrease in their myeloma disease, called a partial response. So we're killing a, about half of their cells, essentially, um, which you can imagine doesn't, doesn't work well. Um, we get a deeper response and patients do better. You can call that very good partial response, complete response. You know, ideally we get them negative to the point we can't even detect their clone by uh, next generation sequencing. But this problem of partial response, as you can imagine, is it's not good for patients because they, they're going to relapse um, very quickly and we're going to need a lot, another line of therapy. Um, so we, so Olivia and Laura in our lab have looked at this patient in depth, uh, 754, um, where we kind of at the right side of the graph, we found that we could actually follow her disease of peripheral blood. So we, uh, after she'd been off of daratumumab for uh, about 27 months, I believe, uh, got a peripheral blood sample where we could detect myeloma and measure its drug sensitivity in her blood. And then, you know, basically follow how she did on, on CD38 uh, monoclonal antibody therapy in samples four through six there. So what they found was, you know, interestingly, again, there's a couple of different subpopulations that we can appreciate by flow cytometry here. Um, they both responded pretty well to, they have both have high levels of CD38. They both respond pretty well to the, to both monoclonal antibodies, ex vivo and our MyDST assay. And then the, when we re-sampled uh, re this person's blood, uh, we could see that, you know, the myeloma cells had decreased. It's already a pretty rare population of 0.8%. Um, before starting treatment, but then down to 0.027% uh, uh, at follow-up. So ex vivo seemed to predict the, at least some response in the, to this, although she really didn't have even a partial response to the, to the drug overall in terms of antibody levels. So, so the next um, kind of modality that we've been using to, to kind of in, interrogate this subpopulation question was to develop a CYTOF panel or mass cytometry um, to really tease out the myeloma subpopulations. And, and the, the panel here is really designed to look at a bunch of myeloma markers. So we're not getting as good of resolution as the, at the normal of the normal cells, but we are covering all these immune therapy targets that I've been talking about, the intracellular targets of MEDs like Icarus proteins, MYC, um, anti-apoptotic proteins like BCL2. So we're trying to, you know, basically increase the depth of our understanding of, of these subpopulations. And, and we, again, we're looking at 754 uh, and the 0.3 time point before she went on uh, uh, isotuximab. Um, and you can see there's a tiny myeloma population, but we can detect, detect it by cytot um, as indicated by these lambda positive cells. And they're, you know, very intriguingly, kind of this very CD38 negative, uh, sorry, CD38 positive portion of that. And on the other hand, a very CD38 uh, negative looking population, which we didn't really appreciate by flow. Um, and we looked at the other markers in this and we kind of can possibly, you know, hypothesize that you could develop a candidate uh, approach to treating this situation a little bit more effectively than just targeting CD38 alone in this example. Um, so Lauren in our lab has kind of taken this to the next level. We started looking at peripheral blood more broadly in our patients. And um, so myeloma patients, it's pretty common to have a population that's less than 1% of these myeloma cells circulating. So they're hard to find, but if we um, basically, you know, increase the number that we put through the flow cytometer, um, we can detect these rare populations pretty well. And you can see these three examples where it definitely in, in, in one case on the top here, there are a couple of different myeloma subpopulations that we are identifying. Uh, and then the other two, if they're, they're, if they're present, they're, at least in the main population, there may be kind of variable marker expression that still implicates that some of them more, may be more or less resistant to targeting one particular target. So that's, that's work that's ongoing for Lauren's project. So 
we we kind of started looking at at, at this more um, in depth in terms of the analysis. So Zach, uh, Dennis, and Lorraine really um, have been have you know pioneered this for our group um, with help from Brett Stevens um, and the Jordan Lab, and and some of these Cytoff samples that we started doing initially, we started appreciating there were two myeloma subpopulations. So there's kind of this target low population that I've highlighted with a red box and a target high population in the green box. And because interestingly, it seemed like all the targets that I've been talking to you about were high in one of those populations and low in the other group. So it really seemed like there were potential for, you know, a drug resistant population that we're not gonna really treat very effectively, may lead to partial response to therapy and may come back unless we figure out how to target that better. And that leads to a whole host of questions that we'd like to evaluate in, in the future. Uh, how does, how do, what, what makes that target low population unique? Is it less differentiated? Um, are there any tools in our toolbox that we can use to treat those cells? Um, so that's ongoing. So taking that to another level, um, Dennis, um, who, uh, who just went to MD PhD program at Emory last year, um, worked on the analysis pipeline, set up our analysis pipeline for this Cytoff data and found that machine learning was actually a really uh, handy way to analyze Cytoff data. There's not too many parameters to go into the algorithm so that it, um, it, you know, it gets over overburdened. Uh, but enough to give it uh, a lot to work with. And machine learning or random forest classification is just basically running a ton of decision trees and seeing um, you know, uh, how these markers are related and what is most important in determining what subpopulation they end up in. Um, we found that Icarus 1 and ERF 4 were really important in this sample 1389, which is a plasma cell leukemia sample that we initially studied. Um, and very interestingly, um, two of the top three important uh, markers, intracellular proteins really um, were also critical. So, so it kind of basically um, breaks down uh, into these decision trees where we're having a Icarus low, ERF4 low population or Icarus high, uh, ERF4 high population. Um, similarly on this, on this side of the, the branch, so you have these populations, again, that are target low and kind of less differentiated uh, in terms of their Icaros and ERF4 expression, which are really kind of turned on at the plasma cell stage. So that was, um, that was kind of amazing to us and we're continuing to kind of analyze this in more samples, but that's kind of what we have on that so far. Um, so the ramifications are pretty interesting. So if we just look at, you know, the white chain expressing cells to tell us what's myeloma, um, look at a target like CD46 and on the surface and then intracellular target like Icaros. Um, you know, maybe we can target um, that myeloma target high population in a certain way, but, you know, maybe a drug like almost a taxine that at least, you know, seems like it's, it's preserved on the target low population may give us a way to treat that other population. And so I'll uh, last tell you just a briefly a story about initial uh, work we've been doing with single cell RNA sequencing to again interrogate these subpopulations. Uh, we've done this in another patient that I'll tell you about, um, 1093. And this patient again didn't have high risk features at diagnosis, but only lived two years, just had horrible disease. And I'm showing you both the M protein and the light chain for the reason here that they're different and they follow different patterns, uh, which is incredibly interesting. But basically, at diagnosis, you have both light chain. Uh, in blue and M protein in, in red as high, and then you know undergo treatment works pretty well to get a remission, but unfortunately relapse really quickly before even getting to autologous stem cell transplant. Um, I think we discovered this actually in this patient when they were admitted for the transplant. Um, then, it, but it's only the light chain here that's that's um, up at relapse. Um, you can see the light chain causes a second relapse there but then goes quiescent and really doesn't do anything after that. And this M protein uh, producing population, you know, eventually wreaks havoc and, and is drug resistant and, and kills the patient. So, um, so this is kind of fascinating to us. And so we did this single cell RNA seq where 
again, we identified two, um, we identified heterogeneity in terms of subpopulations. So we have this big green kind of um, puke green population and then this kind of smaller red population. This red population, what was stuck out was that it really had a lot of immunoglobulin gene uh, expression compared to this one. Um, whereas this one had a little bit higher MYC and that's shown in, the, in these graphs over here. Um, so even at diagnosis, we're detecting a couple of different subpopulations in this patient. And so if you, when we looked at the pathways that were different, you know, it was kind of striking to us that protein translation and electron transport chain or OXFOS were by far the top two pathways that were um, significant here. You can see the p-values in these top two pathways are uh, much more significant than the rest. So we, we think that, that, you know, that this is a way to kind of identify what's, what's under the hood in these cells. Um, so furthermore, we looked at, um, we actually had done two relapse times points. Unfortunately, the third, we didn't get enough cells, but even in the second relapse, you can see that really we kind of obliterated this, totally obliterated this uh, um, uh, IG high population in light yellow. It's pretty much gone. And the cells that are there, although they look less, they're just, you know, they're, they're less detectable, um, are this kind of make high population. So if you look, take another look at this patient's graph and, and that, under that lens, you can see that this light chain population really nicely corresponds to that population that is only expressing light chain, basically. It doesn't have all the IGH uh, gene, genes expressed. Um, whereas at diagnosis, we had both. So um, really unfortunate, we didn't get data from this time point because it would have, we would predict it would have been the opposite scenario where this, this IGH um, high population was really what came back and wreaked havoc for this patient. So we have one tube left at the diagnosis uh, time point and one, one tube left at time point three that we're basically treasuring and, and planning future experiments to kind of evaluate this question further. And so lastly, before I stop, I'm just gonna give a quick plug to Lauren Davis. I won't steal a lot of her thunder, but she's been uh, again using Cytoff and um, flow cytometry um, based assay that she's developed to look at the drug resistance uh, to imids in terms of the expression of Icarus in the Icarus pathway. Um, where she does the ex vivo treatment with, with uh, uh, imids such as lenalidomide. You can see here that this sample had a really nice Icarus high population, uh, myeloma population, and then a, a really nicely low Icarus myeloma population in this plasma cell leukemia patient. You treat ex vivo with the lenalidomide and that Icarus, uh, as we would expect, it goes away completely. So, um, so keep your eye out for Lorraine on the uh, cancer biology speaking, speakers circuit um, where you can learn more about that. Um, so overall, our program is uh, basically, um, now that we know we can, um, you know, we have all these different tools uh, that are fun to play with in terms of different drugs to treat this disease, both in terms of monoclonal antibodies, small molecules that are unique, and next generation immune therapies, uh, gives us a lot of options to play with as far as how do we how do we really optimize the next generation of therapy going forward? We've really, a lot's changed in myeloma and, and I think we have a real opportunity here to continue to benefit patients um, substantially. So, you know, now that we know we can um, collect blood and detect myeloma, at least in some patients, we'd like to collect blood kind of throughout their disease history, you know, bone marrow when it's available, but, you know, blood gives us, you know, makes it a lot easier for us to get um, samples um, you know, find ways to really use my DST to optimize their treatment, develop new drugs, and then use these kind of uh, Cytop and single cell technologies to understand, you know, the drug sensitivity profiles of different subpopulations. So with that, I'll conclude and just say that, um, you know, I really feel that myeloma is the ideal disease for a functionalized uh, precision medicine approach. And in my DST, we've we found to be sensitive and specific um, for myeloma. Uh, and right now, Peter Forsberg's um, got a trial um, with Carrier Farm where we're going to study this pro prospectively, not using it to really guide treatment at this point, but basically a validation cohort where everything's controlled, and we'll see 
you know, are we really able to predict what, um, what treatments are gonna work best for patients? Um, as Olivia has nicely shown, um, you can probably retreat with a CD38 directed therapy, but you gotta wait at least 15 months before treating them. And you might wanna consider class switching. Um, so those are clinically uh, actionable points. Um, but even in that setting, it, uh, you know, as I illustrated from 754 case, um, you know, we best, at best got stable disease. We didn't really achieve a great response. So it's, it's kind of like a back pocket um, option. Um, I really feel strongly that translation inhibition is an untapped avenue to treat myeloma. Um, and we're, we've got this trial written again with, with Peter uh, as a PI, um, just basically trying to get this, um, the drug company on board with that. Um, but I, I think it's, it's potentially a great way to uh, expand our toolbox further. Uh, and then future directions, you know, we, we were just starting to scratch the surface on subpopulations, but we believe they're relevant, um, uh, currently just not, not appreciated at all um, in the myeloma community. So I think something that we can really contribute there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the differential target expression we'd like to test now is that equate to differential drug sensitivity. Um, and, you know, are, is it true that our treatments are exerting selective pressure that's really giving rise to a less differentiated phenotype. So with that, I'd like to stop and um, thank all the members, uh, especially in my lab. Uh, very lucky to have this amazing group of young scientists who uh, uh, are an absolute joy to work with. And I feel so lucky I get to uh, get up here and talk about all the, the work that they've done. It's, um, and I look at myself as really their promoter, um, if nothing else. And you know, furthermore, all the, the great collaborators and mentors that I've uh, had here at the university, including Craig, um, members of Craig's lab and other people in the hematology uh, community. Of course, thanks to our funding and, and our patients um, as well. So um, thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, Dan. It, it, it's really uh, awesome to see how you've, you and your team have developed this program. Uh, I've been watching it over the years. It's, it's just really lovely to see how it's evolved to such a great place. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes left. Uh, questions for Dan? Hi, this is Mercedes. Hi. Hi, I have a question for you that, that's very interesting. I, I was fascinated with all the things that you've been doing. So the model that you present is more like a you had different subtypes of cells at the beginning mm -hmm. and some of them are rare. You kill some and the other ones can take over. And I think this is the same problem for any type of cancer and resistance that develop over time. So what about if it's not a diff? and in this case, it makes sense to give combining therapies, right? Because then you target two populations at the same time. But what about if it's not really the presence of the two population or three or five population, but it's an adaptation of the same, the initial population that change, that modify with the therapy, and then they become a, a different subtype. You know what I mean? It's like, it's the pressure, pressure and selection, right? It's, yeah, you may have the same, a different population, but it may be the same one but now modify the metabolism, for instance, because of the pressure of your treatment. And now it's the same cell, but with a different metabolism. Uh, and then it will be resistant to, to the drug. It's always, I think to me, it has been always the toughest question to address. Yes. And the only way would be you have, you know, like a mutation that you can follow genetic. But, and in that case, given that the combining therapy may not be the best thing, it, sequential therapy may be better, which is basically what you're doing. But I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's a really great point, you know, um, and it strikes me also that we're really kind of using snapshot techniques where we fix the cells and then look at their state and these different subpopulations may be in flux constantly. And, you know, the, when we capture them, you know, it really, um, it's just a one point in time and they might be going kind of back and forth more, more fluently. Um, and that's really, you know, for all of us, I think that's a struggle to figure out how to um, check that. I'm yeah. hopeful that, you know, we could at least use this ex vivo platform to 
to see, you know, are the, is one of these subpopulations truly more drug sensitive or mm -hmm. drug resistant? You know, because if we treat and then in culture and then or do our flow or a site off or whatever, um, you know, is it still the really kind of one sub subpopulation that's showing up or is it still just a mix that are both, mix. you know, less um, predominant? Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's true. And I think myeloma is unique. We know we've got a lot of different drugs. They all work pretty well, but not perfectly. So we really have to combine everything. You know, it's, um, it's certainly that's a little bit unique, I, I think, because uh, one drug therapy, the response rates are usually like a third or less. Um, so we really can't get away with that in myeloma. Whereas in other malignancies, if you have a great drug, you know, if you have BCR able and you have a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that inhibits that, um, you know, it's going to work great. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's really, you know, we're trying to make order of chaos here, basically of, you know, going through these complicated drug regimens. Every patient's history is completely different. There's no standard approach to sequencing these. So, you know, no, uh, no one patient's history is going to be the same. Uh, and that's, um, that's certainly a challenge. And so we're, we're trying to use these a couple of cases and expand that number to really understand, you know, what's what's generalizable in a, in a larger population of patients. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, we're, we're a little bit over time, so maybe we can wrap up. But Dan, Dan again, thank you for a, an excellent seminar. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Have a great day, everybody.